right, welcome to the show where we share the stories of the many who intersect with our healthcare system but are rarely heard from. My name is Kevin Poe, founder and editor of Kevin MD. Today in the show, we have Diana Twiggs. She is a family physician and she wrote the Kevin MD article, I am overwhelmed right now. I know I am not alone. Diana, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. This is exciting to be here. So we'll get into your article in a little bit, but first off, can you share your story and your journey to where you are today? Sure. I grew up in Florida um, in a non-medical family, and I uh, really wasn't sure what I wanted to do. So I ended up going to school at Florida State because I wanted a big school. I wanted mm-hmm. whatever it was to be there. So I started college life as a math major, and I tried. I thought about music and English, and I ended up really being drawn to medicine. So um, shortly, actually right after uh, graduating, got married and uh, did medical school at University of Florida. And during that time, trying to decide on on what to do with my life, I ended up um, really uh, loving family medicine just because of the variety. And I wanted to be able to take care of the whole person, the whole family, and not just one specific organ that I I couldn't see uh, keeping me interested through my whole life. So um, went into family medicine and after a brief stint in South Carolina, have been back here in Florida. And I've been in this same building for over 20 years, but with different iterations of the practice. I uh, joined actually my father-in-law in in practice and then ended up uh, becoming the practice owner and now I'm an employed physician in the same building. Um, So I'm doing um, just general uh, primary care Mm -hmm. uh, but also very involved in organized medicine um, particularly mostly at the state level. So um, we uh, we live here and have raised a family here. Tell me what you're seeing um, from your view during the pandemic and especially from an organized standpoint what kind of initiatives um, are you advocating for on behalf of physicians as it relates to the pandemic? Well, one of the things that I was immediately excited about was how in one day, all of a sudden, the barriers to telemedicine went away. Mm -hmm. We had the technology, but just suddenly, hey, you guys can do this, and guess what? We'll pay you for it fairly. So that's been, I think, to me, one of the big practice um, pluses from all this in in a world of a lot of minuses. Um, So I'm seeing uh, patients... A lot really taking to that. It's not for everybody, but a lot of patients are extremely appreciative to have that availability and that technology. And, you know, as far as what I'm seeing in the office, um, just a lot of the usuals, but just, you know, a lot of really fear out there on Mm -hmm. where are we and what's going to happen? Where are we going? Um, A lot of mental health issues, which is a norm in family medicine. You know, we have such a shortage of mental health professionals that a lot of that ends up falling on us. And we are now speaking towards the end of December and the vaccine, two of them now are rolling out. Now, are you seeing a lot of trepidation for the vaccine when patients ask you about them? A little. Mostly my patients are very excited about it. A lot of my elderly patients have said, please sign me up. I'm ready to get it. I said, well, unfortunately, I don't have that yet, but um, most of them are very ready. I've had a few people with some questions about it. Most of the questions, I think, come from disinformation on the vaccines themselves that have so far been approved, but I'd say overwhelmingly people are, are excited to get it. All right, let's transition now into your Kevin MD article. I am overwhelmed right now. I know I'm not alone. Now, for those who haven't read the article, can you just walk my audience through it and maybe share the story of why you decided to write it? Sure. I I start most of my mornings with a run, and I'm often listening to podcasts and news stories. That's just my time to try to catch up on everything. And so I wrote this article in July after having four months of just feeling like I was drinking from a fire hose, and I was still trying to process everything between medical news and world news, and I was trying to get everything in and, and figure out where I needed to be and what I needed to be telling people. And that one particular morning, it was just on the news, tragedy after tragedy. Mm -hmm. And I just started feeling like this is, this is too much. And the more I really thought about it, I thought, you know, I'm not the only one feeling like this. Mm -hmm. Everybody's feeling overwhelmed by this pandemic, by quarantine. But then when I kind of looked around and I thought, but what wonderful things are people also doing? You know, I'm seeing things in my community that just were, full of just neighborly love and really caring for each other. And there were these two, you know, good and bad sides just pulling so much. And I thought, this is just a lot of emotion that I don't think I'm alone in feeling. And, you know, I started it as sort of a blog back in, um, in March when I, I realized, you know, we're at a unique moment in history and Mm -hmm. rather than just writing in my journal, what I think about this 
maybe people want to hear what I'm going through and what I have to say, but, but what my experience is in a family medicine office. So I started doing that and, and that particular podcast just came to me on a run as a lot of them do when I thought, this is so much. I just want to express to everybody that you're probably feeling this and so am I, and let's just keep taking care of each other. Now, what were some of the specific thoughts and feelings that you were going through as you were writing that? And what are some of the techniques that you used to help get you through that? Well, one of the stories that morning had to do with a, a young black man who was um, a boy who was jumped for no reason whatsoever other than his race. And I just thought the amount of hate in that was just overwhelming to me. And on the same page, and I put that in the article, was the story of a man in our community who we all literally thought had probably died. And mm. he was coming back from um, a long-term care situation, and he had nothing. And the, just seeing the community come together to bring him the physical things he needed and really support him, I thought, you know, on the one hand, and also just by the way, was a black man. And I thought, you know, the same communities that are just tearing each other apart, really, I'm seeing the other side where people are just being so compassionate towards each other and, and helping each other and, and people bringing groceries to their, you know, their asthmatic neighbor and their elderly. So I wrote it just thinking what things are coming into my world that I'm needing to process, you know, between not just the information, but the, um, ha I love to travel and I'm, you know, I've been at home for, you know, not in, in the office, but I have not been anywhere in the longest time. And it feels a little bit selfish to say, gosh, I just want to get out of here and go do something. But that's just a little part of, of all these little things we're all feeling. So in a way it was sort of a vent for me to just say, here's a little bit of myself and I'm just going to be vulnerable and say what I'm feeling. Now you wrote that, I believe, in the summer, and we're speaking about six months later, and we're in the midst of the latest wave of the pandemic, and some say it will get worse before the vaccines start to take hold and get better. Now, has any cha anything changed since then, and uh, what are some of the challenges um, right now that you're currently f facing from, I guess, from a mental health standpoint? I think that feeling of when is this going to end, mm -hmm. and even though the vaccine is here, it's not really here. You know, it's, we're only in the very beginnings of it. And even those who have the vaccine, we really have to wait to develop that immunity. And people seem to have a little bit of hope knowing that there is something and it's a big something, but we're just, we have to hang on that little bit longer and just keep taking care of each other and keep taking care of ourselves. And it is so frustrating when you see people not doing that, where one family member is quarantining because of an exposure and the rest of the family says, well, you know, I'm fine. I'm going to go out and do my mm -hmm. thing. So that continues to be a challenge with trying to support people to just do the right thing. It's just the end is a little bit in sight. We're not there, but we can see that it's almost close. I think there's a level of exhaustion, certainly, among healthcare professionals. Um, I see it on my blog. I see it on Facebook. I talk to a lot of clinicians on this podcast who's feeling that exhaustion. And already before the pandemic, almost half of physicians express feeling burnt out already, and this is only making it worse. Now, what are some pieces of advice that you could share with these healthcare workers who are on the front lines, who are exhausted, who are burnt out? Uh, what are some things that you could say to help get them through this? You know, I think before this, I, I was one that was feeling um, quite a bit of burnout and um, not that that has disappeared, but in a way I felt a bit energized being in primary care during this pandemic because I felt like this is this is what we're made for. I mean, let's roll up our sleeves and and here we go. And we never knew this would be it, but this is why we do what we do. And I think kind of renewing that sense of calling towards, I'm here to help people, th and that, that has helped a little bit finding new ways to do things and finding new ways to connect with patients, you know, and really realizing that some of my patients, whether they're in person or on telemedicine, I am their only human interaction that day, or mm -hmm. maybe for a couple of days and they're home, they've got their dog and that is it. They live alone. And maybe taking that extra minute, couple of minutes to just listen to them, even if it's not about their diabetes and just, just kind of ask them, not just how are you doing, but so what kind of dog do you have? Just little things that they need to maintain that connection with people and realizing how important that the few minutes I have with them can be. That's great advice. We're talking to Diana Twiggs. She is a family physician and she wrote the Kevin MD article 
I am overwhelmed right now. I know I am not alone. Diana, if there's something that you know now that you wish you knew back before the pandemic started, what, what, what would that be? Well, I do wish I had known how long this would last. Mm -hmm. You know, I think early on we thought, oh, we'll, we'll hold our breaths for a few minutes. And I think even anybody who's been through medical training is, you know, we're pretty savvy at delayed gratification. But even then, we, we had some idea of the process, how long things would take. There was a lot that was very predictable about training and what our lives were going to be doing. And every day seems like an unknown here where we think things are getting better and then they get worse and then they get better and now they're mm -hmm. worse again. And, and then new non-pandemic related events come into our lives. So... I think I wish I knew that this was going to be a, truly a long haul and that the hardest part is just really not, not being able to say, well, it'll end at this particular time. One of the things that you talked about earlier was, um, of course, telemedicine and how that impacted primary care. Now, once the pandemic finishes, whenever that may be, um, how do you envision telemedicine playing a role going forward? Well, I think we can't go back on it. I think uh, physicians love it. Patients love it. Um, not everybody, but there's a large section that just, I as a patient love it. I don't have to drive down to see my primary care physician that, you know, I can just uh, from my office, not have the drive time, but um, you know, do, do this exact same format and have my visit. So I think that telemedicine is here to stay. I truly hope that we can continue with proper reimbursement for it and not have to go back to closing the door on that um, because it is every bit as intellectually difficult to, to have a telemedicine visit with a patient. Um, it, it's, not, it's not nearly easier, it's possibly harder. And I, I think we need to be fairly reimbursed for that because it takes the exact same amount of mental capacity and all of our training and then some to be able to do a proper telemedicine visit. Uh, I've been really grateful for those teachers that have been able to tell us who were not experienced with that, how to really run a, a proper and um, useful telemedicine visit, including some physical. I've been very surprised how much physical exam can be done mm -hmm. via a teleconference. Now, from your perspective, being involved with organized medicine, and I'm sure you talk to people within government, perhaps someone, people in, you know, within the health insurance industry. Now, what's your sense about their views when it comes to reimbursing telemedicine after the pandemic ends? I think some of it is a feeling of um, maybe old laws and regulations tying our hands, the you know, needing to have not just a balanced budget, but the, um, the, the zero um, gain where if you, if you bonus one side, you've got to cut from another. And that's, that's just not practical. No other industry does that. If we're growing as an industry, expenses may have to increase. And, and there's always room for being more efficient and cost cutting. But I think we need to be wise in how we do that. And my final question, what's your take home message that you want to leave with the Kevin MD audience? Share yourself with people. You know, it's okay to be vulnerable. And I've been surprised at how much people have appreciated hearing my story. And, you know, just along the way, I, I really hadn't expected that kind of feedback. But I think go ahead and, and explain to people what what's going on with you. <clears throat> I think just being vulnerable and being able to tell people what um, what your perspective is and mm -hmm. <laughs> being able to laugh with your patients as well as cry with your patients. Anna, thank you so much for sharing your time and insight. And thanks again for being on the show. Thank you so much.